Eric, if you had to narrow it down to precisely one thing, like obviously it's more than one thing, but if you just had to say, like, what one thing more than anything else seems to be the primary mechanism of muscle hypertrophy, what what would you say? Yeah, so that would bring me back to, um, there's a few like pretty in-depth reviews about the mechanism of, of muscle hypertrophy. Usually they narrow it down to mechanical tension, muscle damage, and metabolic stress. And I actually would, uh, you know, I, I would say that mechanical tension being the first one there, that, that's the one I would go with um, if I had to pick one. Yeah, so I, I agree with you. I, I think that's a great answer. Uh, and with that context, uh, a paper was recently published uh, with a very provocative title, Effective Resistance Training Mainly Depends on Mechanical Activation of Fast Twitch Fibers. And so uh, what I want to do in this segment is address partially is that true, but more so does does the paper bearing that title present us with adequate evidence to believe that it's true? Yeah. Um, and so uh, the, the short version just here up top, not, not trying to leave people in suspense is uh, no, I, I don't think we should put much stock, if any, in this particular paper. Uh, and the reason I want to talk about this, the reason I'm doing this segment is I've started seeing this paper going around. I, I think it was published about a month ago. Uh, first time it came across any of my timelines was maybe like two weeks ago. And within the last week, I've seen more and more people sharing it, talking about it, discussing it. Uh, and it's not it's not big yet. It's kind of like simmering below the surface, but I'm concerned that it will kind of reach a critical mass and uh, like, a lot of folks will become aware of it and uncritically accept its findings as true. Uh, so and it, it's like a band that plays the cooler bars in town. And when they have a gig, a lot of people show up, but like right. they don't have a huge record deal yet. Correct. Yeah. 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 So, um, yeah, basically, I I think that this is a, 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 a paper with findings built on incredibly shaky foundations that I don't think we should put much stock in. So I, I want to do this segment just to just to head that off, essentially. Cool. Um, and just as a general note, if you have shared this paper, uh, perhaps uncritically, um, I, this isn't a call out segment. I don't I don't begrudge you for doing that. I certainly don't think less of you for doing that. Um, because like the the title of the paper and its purported findings do seem to track well with things we already know. Uh, mechanical tension seems to be very important for hypertrophy. So a people a paper saying mechanical activation of fast twitch fibers seem to be the primary driving factor of hypertrophy. That seems to comport well with what we already know. And you know if things already confirm what you know or strongly suspect to be true, you might be a little bit less likely to look into it deeply. Um, and also like, I, I do think that there's just sort of a general zeitgeist around trying to find like a grand unified theory of hypertrophy. And that sort of thing is just kind of like intrinsically appealing to people. And the other reason I don't begrudge folks for taking this paper uncritically is this study and also kind of the study it's built upon are very math heavy, <laughs> like <laughs> extremely math heavy. Uh, and so like, I, I, I'm the type of sick fuck who's willing to look at that and be like, Ooh, okay, let's, let's put all of these equations in a spreadsheet, kind of work through them, see what's going on here. But like, I totally get that if someone either doesn't have a strong math background or is just like a normal person with plenty of things to do in, in a day, you just see more than like three Greek letters in a block of text and say, Nope, fuck it. Like I'm, I'm just going to trust that the authors did everything right because it's not worth my time to get into this. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Uh, if I can make a quick comment before you dig into the details here, uh, I don't mean to grab the steering oh, yeah, wheel, yeah, but go for it. I really like the way that you, it was a very subtle thing, but the way that you uh, kind of alluded to confirmation bias there, where, mm -hmm. where basically it seems to comport well with kind of how you generally view things. And so you just kind of uncritically say, yeah, that, that works, that makes sense. And you, and you roll with it. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people believe deep down that like 
confirmation bias is a malicious act of cherry picking Mm -hmm. and that like when someone is committing confirmation bias or or expressing it they're like digging in and saying how can i prove myself right despite contradictory evidence but i think the more um uh the more damaging version of confirmation bias is just that thing where you say it's not that i'm like maliciously cherry picking but like because this comports with what I would expect, I'm simply not going to scrutinize it with that same level of intensity. Oh, yeah, for sure. And, and I mean, I 100% do that as well. It, it's like, a natural. That's it's, why it's, it's a, a term. It's a time saving mechanism. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like if if a paper comes across the journal sweep and it's like, <laughs> hey, hey, it's uh, high low training versus low low training. And we're looking to see which one has a larger effect on one RM strength. Oh, the high low training did. Cool. Like, I'm not going to look into that paper in detail and say, like, yeah. does this finding hold up? Because it's like, well, I I know or at least so strongly suspect that to be true. I don't care that much about the details. Like, I'm, yeah. I'm just going to put another tally in the high load training is better column, you know? And, and there is a, a considerable degree of redundancy in our, our field. Oh, yeah. And, and I, I kind of chuckled because I was thinking about, like, you know, a paper comes across and says, yeah, creatine made people a little stronger. Am I really going to be like, well, I need to email the author because I, I can't find supplementary table number three. Correct. You know, it's, yeah. it, it's just you, you file it away and say, yeah, that, that makes sense. Correct. Yeah. So uh, uh, to be clear, what I'm arguing here is not that mechanical activation of fast twitch fibers aren't a predictive factor for hypertrophy. What I'm arguing is this is not the study you, you should rely on to make that point. Yeah. All right. So... um. At this point, if you're if you're watching on YouTube, we can just flash the or we can just put the the abstract uh, up here because I think that's the part of the study that most people have actually read at this point. Uh, and for people listening, uh, I'm just going to read the abstract just so we can all kind of get our feet wet and understand the sorts of claims that this paper is making. Uh, so the abstract says. Uh, This study conducted a secondary survey based on the hypothesis that, quote, total mechanical activation of fast twitch fibers in the muscles determines the effects of muscle hypertrophy, close quote, with resistance training of the knee extensor muscles as the target because of its importance in preventing sarcopenia. Using a mathematical model that estimates the mechanical activation of each muscle fiber, parentheses, fast twitch and slow twitch fibers, close parentheses, during exercise, which was developed in a previous study, We estimated the total mechanical activation of fast twitch fibers in 30 training programs described in 23 selected previous studies on leg extension exercise programs and their muscle hypertrophy effect. With the estimated value and other factors of the training effect described in previous studies, training volume, etc., as explanatory variables, and muscle hypertrophy effect as an objective variable, uh, we performed multiple regression analysis. The results revealed that the training effect was related to total mechanical activation of the fast twitch fibers, uh, training load, and number of sets, uh, with the beta coefficients being positive for mechanical activation of fast twitch fibers and training load, and uh, negative for number of sets. Uh, Going on, the total mechanical activation of fast twitch fibers was the strongest determinant of the muscle hypertrophy effect. That one quote right there, as an aside, that one quote right there, I think, is the thing people are are really focusing on uh, going on. In addition, we predicted the relationship between the level of the training effect of leg extension exercise and program variables. This study is the first to demonstrate, quote, the relationship between total mechanical activation of fast twitch fibers and muscle hypertrophy effect, close quote, in the field of muscle physiology, and the first to elucidate the association between the program variables and the training effect. So uh, just in layman's terms, to break all of that down, what they did for this study is they went through the literature. They didn't do a, a truly systematic literature search. Essentially, they they developed some key terms and just, just looked at the hundred, like the first hundred studies with those key terms in them uh, and looked for the ones uh, where there was a longitudinal knee extension training intervention uh, with you know, all of the information they would need to apply their model to it. Uh, And they identified 23 such studies in the 100 results they screened uh, with 30 different training protocols that assessed hypertrophy over time. Once they found those studies and those protocols, they used a mathematical model that they'd previously developed to estimate total fast twitch fiber activation during each protocol. So that's like, that's an integrated effect sort of area under the curve. Uh, And then from there, 
They performed multiple regression analysis to see which training variables were predictive of hypertrophy responses. And what they found is that the strongest best predictor was total mechanical activation of fast twitch fibers, uh, which was positively associated with hypertrophy. And then the other thing people seem to be pulling out of this, I think erroneously, uh, is that in their multiple regression model, there was a negative beta coefficient for um, uh, for number of sets, like total training volume. And people are using this to argue like, ooh, like everyone's wrong about the effect of training volume on muscle growth. There's a negative beta coefficient here. If you do more volume, that leads to less growth. But with multiple regression, that that's basically saying when you hold, like, when accounting for the other variables in the model, this seems to be negatively predictive. And so essentially, total activation of fast twitch fibers is positively associated with training volume because it's like a, a cumulative metric, like an area under the curve metric. And so essentially that negative beta coefficient is telling you that the additive effect of each additional set is smaller and smaller. So just to make that clear. Um, but yeah, anyway, that's that's kind of the the layman. Well, that was a pretty poor layman's terms breakdown. But that's that's sort of the the a grand concise, o- yeah, a concise overview. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the general overview of the study. And like I said, I think the part that jumped out to most people when they were were reading that abstract was just kind of the core kind of flashy finding there in the abstract that total mechanical activation of fast twitch muscle fibers was predictive of hypertrophy. The thing that jumped out at me was uh, this sentence specifically, using a mathematical model that estimates the mechanical activation of each muscle fiber, uh, fast twitch and slow twitch, which was developed in in a previous study. So, you know, they weren't using studies that had measured mechanical activation of fast twitch muscle fibers. They were using uh, a set of equations to estimate that variable. And so that was the thing that jumped out at me. Uh, And the reason that jumped out at me is that I didn't think we could do that particularly well (laughs) Um, for, for a couple of reasons. One is that there aren't that many labs that can actually measure that variable. So if you're interested in looking at the actual like recruitment and activation patterns of different fiber types, you need a very particular EMG setup, like high density EMG that you can use to decompose the signals and look at individual fibers, which you can then split out by fiber type. And there aren't that many labs that can do that that type of research. And I also think we're kind of a long way from being able to do that type of research with dynamic exercise, like, you know, eccentric and concentric knee extensions, because for high density EMG to get good signals that you can decompose and look at the individual fibers, I think think you need to do isometric exercise because you know the electrodes are on the skin and as the muscle contracts like the position of the individual fibers relative to the skin moves a little bit um and so i think you have to do this only with isometric exercise so like that part jumped out at me when i was reading the abstract because i was like oh like that's that's actually incredibly cool like if there's a a high quality validated uh, equation or set of equations to be able to predict um, like fast twitch and slow twitch fiber activation in dynamic exercise uh, with any, any reasonable degree of granularity. That's if that exists, like that's, that's a pretty big deal. Uh, And I didn't know that existed. So uh, I was like, okay, let's look at the paper that they're saying uh, like, validated that equation uh and so to be clear the the main paper i'm talking about here effective resistance training mainly depends on mechanical activation of fast twitch fiber like that paper its findings rest solely on the validation study it's citing like because their their data like their their predicted data for fast twitch fiber activation for their main study that all came from the equations developed in the prior study they're citing to, which if you want to check all of this out in the main paper, it's citation 20, you can pull it up for yourself. And so if the the paper they're citing to, if it shows 
good, strong data to say like, hey, based on these variables, we can predict fast twitch fiber activation very well, then this might be a good, reliable, robust finding. If we look at this validation study and it doesn't seem to predict fast twitch fiber activation particularly well, or heaven forbid, if that's not even what that study was doing in the first place, uh, you know, maybe we're, we're dealing with a, a house built on sand here. Uh, so I pulled up the validation study. The title was Proposal and Validation of Mathematical Model for Resistance Training. And before I get into this, uh, Eric, mm -hmm. can you just describe to me how validation studies tend to work in our field? Yeah, so, you know, there's different types of validity and therefore different types of validation studies. Mm -hmm. Um I didn't do any equation validation in my PhD. We would normally do validation for instruments. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty straightforward. You're pretty much comparing to a gold standard criterion measurement and saying, hey, how, how close did we get? Um, but generally speaking, when you're trying to develop and validate an equation, uh, you need to recruit a sample that's theoretically representative of the population you're trying to validate this in. Mm -hmm and derive the predictive equation. So you measure some data, you measure the outcome of interest, basically say, okay, which of these predictors and, and in what combination do we get a good you know, predictive equation that, that describes or explains the variance in that outcome, mm -hmm. right? And that's the first step. But if you bring in any sample of people, you, you can get an equation, right? right. Yeah. Like things vary and therefore you will get an equation if you really want one. Yes. The point where it becomes validation is when you say, you know what, the equation we got from these individuals also works with other samples of individuals from this population. Yes. So transferring those values, because you will get values, transferring those to other samples effectively and reliably is where the magic happens. Right. So the the two things there is one, uh, you want you want to recruit a representative sample and you also generally want it to be a large enough sample that you can have reasonable reasonable confidence that the equations you derive the findings you get will generalize to the broader population yeah and two um generally and i think always you want to actually measure the thing you're trying to predict yeah so for example if you were trying to make a new body composition equation you might have people do a four compartment body composition assessment and then look at their maybe age lean mass sex maybe activity level just whatever like any number of things and then develop a set of equations to see okay we've measured their body composition we have this other data can we use these other variables to predict body comp which which we measured and then you get another sample in and say, hey, we measure their body composition. We collect this other data. Does that set of equations that I previously developed still predict body comp pretty well in this other sample? Okay. So the, but quite notably there, you assessed body comp in both of those samples. Right. If that's the thing you're trying to validate for. Um, so when diving into this validation study, uh, the first thing that jumped out at me is there were only six subjects, which, I mean, maybe those are six subjects that are incredibly representative of the target population they were drawn from. Uh, and generally, I'm not the the type of person to uh, like be such a nitpicker about sample size, but for for validation studies, like you need more than that. And that's six subjects total. That's not one population of six subjects and then see if equations hold up in another population of six subjects. It's just six subjects, which, uh, not a ton. Uh, and then uh, the second thing that jumped out at me, and this is really the kicker, they didn't measure fast twitch fiber activation in this study. Like, they just didn't. Uh, like you can read the methods for yourself. This the both of these studies I'm talking about. Full text is free. They'll be linked in the show notes. You can read this for yourself. At no point in the study did they actually measure fast twitch fiber activation. They didn't even measure EMG. Like nothing that was even like a proxy for muscle activation at all. Uh, and so, if you work your way through the study, ultimately what they were doing is they were using quite a lot of complex math 
to predict how many reps people would be able to complete during sets to failure with different loads at different contraction velocities and with different rest intervals. And how this worked is essentially they had like 17 protocols they put these people through and they looked to see whether like they developed a set of equations to predict uh, how many reps they'd be able to complete on subsequent sets of like five set protocols uh, with six of the 17 protocols. And then they looked to see whether the equations they developed from those six protocols could predict uh, reps to failure with the other 11 protocols with slightly different mixes of training variables, uh, which, you know, is a completely reasonable way to do a validation study. But again, generally, you'd, you'd probably want more than six subjects. Um, but like the important thing here is this was not a validation study to see if they could predict fast twitch fiber activation. It just wasn't. Um, what it was is there was one particular equation in the set, like in the large set of equations they used that contained assumptions about fast and, to and slow twitch fiber activation and total fiber activation. Um, and it seems to be what they're doing is saying, well, assumptions about fiber activation were built in, were kind of baked into the equations we used. The equations we used seem to do a decent job of predicting reps to failure performance. Therefore, all of the assumptions baked into our equations must therefore be true. Wow. Which I don't know what else to say other than that's not how that works. Yeah. Uh, so uh, how a validation study for this might look is that you could measure fast twitch fiber activation during training protocols in a group of subjects. Then you develop a set of regression equations based on, get, on data gathered during those protocols to see if there's a mix of variables that were predictive of actual fast twitch fiber activation. Then you put a new group of subjects through those same training protocols, uh, measure, fiber act measure fast twitch fiber activation as that new group of subjects goes through these protocols, and then see whether the equations you developed on that first population did actually predict fast twitch fiber activation in the second population. That's, that's how you might do a, a validation study to predict fast twitch fiber activation from various tr like training program characteristics. That's not what they did in their, in their validation study. To be clear, like to put this in no uncertain terms, the validation study they're citing was not a validation study for predicting fast twitch fiber activation. It simply, it simply wasn't. And I, I don't know how else to put it. Yeah. So uh, essentially the, the main paper I'm talking about here is it's, it's a, a house built on sand. Like, the the data going into their model for prediction of fast twitch fiber activation from those 23 studies and 30 training protocols there is no reason to suspect that they were accurately predicting fast twitch fiber activation in those 23 studies no reason whatsoever yeah um and so uh yeah i mean that's that's the bulk of my critique uh it's this isn't a study to to put like any stock in whatsoever and i'll also note just in broad strokes like if you if you didn't want to get into all of the nerd shit of actually going to look at their supposed validation study for this and and digging into it uh you could just look at the text of the study itself so there's uh and if you're watching on youtube we can we can flash an image up here um like there's a figure just showing the the bivariate relationship between their predicted mechanical activation of fast twitch fibers and increase in muscle size and like you can look at it for yourself there's not much of a relationship there like in in the two protocols with the lowest predicted mechanical activation of fast twitch fibers not much hypertrophy occurred and then there's one like one study where like an absurd amount of hypertrophy occurred that did also have a high predicted amount of mechanical activation of fast twitch fibers but beyond those like three data points everything from like the the y-axis or the x-axis here goes from like 200 to 1600 everything from like 500 to 1600 looks basically the same like you could just draw a straight line through that data like just 
just pure visual inspection tells you that there's not a particularly strong relationship there. Um, and if that's not enough, going an additional step deeper, like the actual model they developed in their supposed validation study also just conflicts with experimental evidence in this area. So I got another question for you, Eric. So yeah, you're, let's hear it. You're a bodybuilder, uh, a two sport professional bodybuilder. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm a bodybuilder, but I more think of myself as a classic bodybuilder. Yeah, that's yeah. fair. But I mean, you you are a pro at both. Correct. The Bo Jackson of bodybuilding. Many yeah. people are saying. So you know you know a thing or two about building muscle and how you might personally train to go about trying to build muscle. And so you know, let's say you wanted to do some low load training. For for any number of purposes, maybe you just want a bit of masochistic fun. Maybe you're trying to train around or through an injury and you can't load a joint particularly heavy. And, and you have two options on the table. You can either do three all-out sets of 30 reps with a load that you can only do 30 reps with. So, so three sets to failure, 30 reps per set, really getting after it. Or, alternately, you could do nine sets of 10 reps. Uh, with the same load, a load that you could do 30 reps with, with nice long rest intervals per set, uh, and you know, you're know you equating the number of reps you're doing, it's 90 reps regardless. Uh, with but the same load? Yeah, with the same load, but it's three sets of 30 versus nine sets of 10. Which one of those protocols do you think you would derive a, a stronger growth stimulus from? I would expect the, the three sets of 30. Yeah, so I I would as well, but again, like so this is something else we've talked about on the podcast before like when you're evaluating research, are are you signing actually maybe we maybe this was a mass audio thing. Uh the, the thing about eating fruit and whether that makes you gain or lose 20 pounds or whatever. Yeah. Uh anyways, um yeah, so we we've talked about like are you willing to take the results of a study literally or not? And if you're willing to cite this paper and say, hey, this is this is proof that uh, uh, mechanical activation of fast twitch fibers is the predictive factor of hypertrophy. If you're willing to do that and you're you're signing on to this, this is a literal finding that we should take seriously, then you are implicitly signing on to the study they're citing for predicting fast twitch fiber activation. And when you look into that, that that would lead you to the point where you would then therefore have to argue that the nine sets of 10 would be a better hypertrophy stimulus, which right. I don't think many people would want to like yeah. the, I don't I don't think many people are going to carry water for that idea. So and if I could just contextualize that, you mentioned the fruit study. Basically, there is a study indicating there's two different groups. One group, they're like, hey, try to eat like a little more fruit. And that's the entire intervention. And yeah. the other group, they're like, hey, have a little bit less fruit. And that's the entire intervention. And they ended up having like a 30 pound gap in weight change over like the six month trial. And, and my my argument was like, no one actually believes this. Yeah. <laughs> like no one li literally believes that to be true. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the model that they developed in their previous study with assumptions about fast and, t and slow twitch fiber activations baked in, uh, their model essentially assumes that fast twitch fiber activation progressively decreases due to fatigue, wh which is probably true. Like that is potentially and, and maybe even likely one of the reasons why uh, training with really short rest intervals is maybe less productive for hypertrophy than slightly longer rest intervals as fatigue accumulates. Uh, fiber recruitment might drop off a little bit. Um, their model also assumes that fast twitch fiber activation doesn't increase as a set progresses. And again, if, if you're watching on YouTube, there's a figure from that validation study that we can put up here. This is figure three uh, A and B. So it shows uh, predicted uh, fast twitch and total fiber activation uh, during uh, sets with 80% of 1RM. And like it, like if you're watching this on YouTube, you can just look at it. If you're listening, I can describe it to you. Uh, essentially, it's showing predicted fast twitch fiber activation in A over nine reps, and it is not changing rep to rep to rep. Uh, like it's a, a solid 
a solid line and the predicted fast twitch fiber activation for each rep is the same as the one before it. And then uh, B is the same prediction, but for the last set of an exercise. And uh, yeah, it, it's the same. Like the predicted fast twitch fiber activation is the exact same for every single rep. So it's, and that does conflict with uh, experimental evidence and also like the best theoretical models we have of fiber activation. Like it seems that as you get closer to failure, um, you recruit more of your higher threshold motor units and uh like the the uh the the depolarization rate of your highest threshold motor units increase as you get closer to failure so that one like their their model does seem to conflict in that way with experimental results um and their model essentially predicts that the total uh like integrated area under that curve is what is predictive of hypertrophy and so essentially what that signs you up to believe is that the earliest reps in a set are just as stimulating for hypertrophy as the later reps in a set there's there's no difference between those reps and the activation of fast twitch fibers does decrease as fatigue accumulates so you don't want to go to failure and you don't want to have short rest intervals you want to stay a long way from failure and have nice long rest intervals so you don't accumulate fatigue and fast twitch fiber activation stays high. So if you take this model seriously, like you you would be saying nine sets of 10 at a 30 RM load is better for hypertrophy than three sets of 30 at a 30 RM load. Like that's like, w like would that, 30 sets of three be even better. Potentially so. Which again, like I, I don't think anyone would actually argue for in the real world. But right. if you, if you're taking this model seriously, you have to be willing to argue for that because that is a logical implication of this model that you're putting your weight behind. Yeah. Um, and so like that also just like conflicts with longitudinal hypertrophy research we have. So there was a paper by uh, Lasavikius and colleagues in 2019 called Muscle Failure Promotes Greater Muscle Hypertrophy in Low-Load But Not High-Load Training. And it was essentially a study looking at, at this scenario we're describing. So there were four conditions here, uh, two high-load, two low-load conditions. Uh, two of the conditions, subjects just performed three sets to failure. And in the other two, so a high-load to failure condition, a low-load to failure condition. And then the other two groups, one high-load, one low-load group, they did five sets with 60% of the number of reps as the to failure condition. So uh, essentially, if you completed 80 total reps across three sets to failure in the low load condition, you would do uh, five sets of 16 to equate the total number of reps. So it, it would be 60% the number of reps per set for 60% more sets. So it, it all works out or 66 whatever like you 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 get what i'm saying yeah uh or if someone did like three sets of 10 to failure in the high load condition 30 total reps for the non-failure condition they would do five sets of six reps to equate uh and so in that study if if you were taking this model literally and seriously you would predict that the non-failure conditions would cause at least as much hypertrophy as the failure conditions if not more uh and what they did, in fact, actually find, and if you're watching this on YouTube, we'll, we'll put the results up on the screen. The two high load conditions caused the same amount of hypertrophy. So the failure and non-failure condition both led to similar muscle growth. And then for the low load conditions, the failure condition led to considerably more muscle growth than the, than the non-failure condition. So again, if, if you were taking this model seriously, that would... Th this finding would fully conflict with that model. It should be better to do the low load training further from failure so you don't accumulate as much fatigue so fast twitch fiber activation stays higher. That is not what we see in the actual experimental uh, research. So uh, just to recap, uh, the equations used in this study to predict fast twitch fiber activation uh, haven't actually been validated for predicting fast twitch fiber activation. And th this whole segment could could have just ended there like that that wouldn't be any fun though yeah that, that's that's enough to completely obsolete the uh the main study i'm talking about here um 
But then also like the logical implications of the model that this is all based on uh, conflict with experimental data and also just real world experience. Like no, no one would actually train in the way that it is suggested you should train if you take this model seriously. Yeah. Uh, so that's all I've got. And uh, apologies if this segment came across as too mean or too harsh. But like I said, this this study seems to be starting to gain a foothold. And I just think it would be a real shame if if it kind of entered the public zeitgeist and folks were being like, oh yeah, like this is... This is really solid stuff. We know what is predict like we know what's causing hypertrophy based on this study because y- you just shouldn't you shouldn't draw that conclusion from it. Like it's it's not uh like not to be too harsh, but like it's it's just not good work. Yeah. Um and so yeah, like I you know, I think there's value in debunking misinformation that's already out there. And I also think there's value in debunking misinformation before it starts to take off. And that's, that's what I'm trying to do here. Yeah, no, I I think you did a great job. And I I think it's, it's really important when you're looking at a new study um, and you have access to the full text, just a couple quick things to prevent from being led totally astray by some of the chatter on social media. Look at what actually got measured. Mm -hmm. Uh, Look at not just the direction of results, but the actual magnitude. Mm -hmm. And then ask yourself in a very literal way, do I believe that? Yeah. And like, I, I know it sounds overly simplistic, but if you just you know, use that as your just entry point into a paper as like the basic bare minimum of interpretation, it'll actually get you pretty far. Yeah. Uh, and, and that was one of the things I, I don't know if I misspoke when explaining the, the intervention with that fruit paper, but one group uh, just had a tiny increase in fruit intake. The other had a tiny decrease and the researchers were saying, oh, what happens to body weight? Greg, you are familiar with fruit, right? I am, yeah. What happens is nothing. <laughs> like when you have when you have two more pieces of fruit per day in a free living situation, you eat a little bit little less of something else and nothing happens for the most part. I mean, I I did a an experiment with my diet a while back s- precisely around that. Like yeah. I I was consuming no fruit because I was doing a bunch of meal prep and all of my carbs for the day were already accounted for, mostly from rice. And also a larger percentage than I'm comfortable with from onions. I really yeah. like onions, but sometimes I eat so many onions, I smell like onions. And that's probably less than ideal. So I was like, hey, let's let's just mix things around and let's get rid of all other carb sources. I'm just eating chicken and fruit. Yeah. And so like if that study was to be taken literally, like the the group that increased fruit consumption gained like 15 pounds. The group that decreased fruit consumption lost like 15 pounds. Yeah. So, and we're talking about a difference in fruit servings of like two or three plus or minus. A day, Or potentially even less. Yeah. So I I went from zero servings of fruit per day to, I don't know exactly how they quantified it in that study, but probably like 25 servings of fruit per (laughs) day. And like, it was fine. Uh, Yeah. On net, it seemed to be productive, but... uh, I just kind of got tired of of cutting up all of that fruit. And also, like, I don't like going to the store that often. This was the biggest thing. Like, fruit goes bad. And this this isn't food safety advice, audience. They tell you, like, food that you cook and then you put in the fridge, you should... I think they say that it's only, like, safe to eat for, like, four or five days. That's a lie. It's good for up to, like, a week and a half that i don't take that seriously i'm not saying that as an expert that's not advice to you me personally up to a week and a half i'm like okay this is fine whatever i've never gotten sick from it yeah anyway fruit goes bad after like three or four days so i i went from going to the store once per seven to ten days to going to the store like every two days i was like ah this is just annoying but in terms of body composition effects it was entirely unremarkable yeah, and if if anything, I, not not to give too much of a spoiler, th- there is some research kind of hinting at the idea that when you add fruit to your diet and you don't change anything else and you're in a free living situation, you might even reduce your caloric intake to to offset that. Uh, you you might end up with a net reduction in calorie intake if you replaced 
kind of low satiety food sources with fruit, right? So if, if you went from like a sugary beverage to, in, to increasing fruit intake, adding that fruit might actually induce just a tiny bit of weight loss, right? Is, so, is that a segue to the next uh, section? It is, but uh, I, I have no idea how I'm going to address editing those two things together. Oh, that, uh, that's that's totally fine. I can but, just put a nice bow on my segment right here and we can get into yours. Do it, yeah. So yeah, j just to fully recap. Um, oh, but wait, I didn't make the point I was trying to make. The point I was trying point. to make is, again, with the people who were kind of sharing that fruit study all over the place, it's like if the first thing they did was look at the magnitude of weight change and just ask themselves, do you believe that increasing your fruit by a couple servings a day really is going to cause you to gain 15 pounds? And do you really believe that reducing by a couple servings a day is really going to cause you to lose 15 pounds? If all you did was ask yourself that question, you'd say, no, and you'd shut your computer and walk away, yeah. right? But but it got all this attention and no one bothered to ask themselves, do I believe this? Yeah. Yeah, but go ahead. Yeah, so the the main point I want to I want you to walk away with is just in the context of this particular study. Again, title, effective resistance training mainly depends on mechanical activation of fast twitch fiber. I am not arguing that that is maybe even potentially not a true statement. Who knows? It could be the point I'm making is that you shouldn't rely on this citation to make that point. And if you see people start to discuss this study, start to share it around, maybe share this podcast clip with them. Or if you, do, you know, if you uh, d aren't feeling uh, generous and wanting to give us the traffic, uh, just ask them which they think would be better for hypertrophy. Nine sets of 10 with a 30 RM load or three sets of 30. And if they say, oh, it's got to be the three sets of 30, say, okay, you don't actually believe what this study is saying um, and uh, implore that they look at the validation study it was based on and ask them, does the validation study actually at any point measure fast twitch fiber activation? Hopefully they'll realize it doesn't and realize uh, maybe this isn't the study they should rely on to make that point.